excuse me, last week in uh, Acts chapter 4, one of the things that uh, we got to was the fact that Christians sometimes have to suffer uh, at the hands of men because they've obeyed God. We see Peter and John uh, being treated uh, poorly. Why? Because they're standing for God, and the men who are opposed to them don't want God basically in their lives. Uh, now, they say they do, but when they are going against God's word, and they had all the markers, remember, in the Old Testament to uh, show them who Christ was, to show them this kingdom and, and see the things that are being done that prove the words of the apostles, they should have recognized it. And we know uh, from other passages that they, the Sanhedrin indeed knew who Christ was, but they went ahead and crucified him anyway. So we want to uh, talk about this just a little bit more about the fact that, that Christians may have to suffer for doing right at the hands of evil men. And, and we ask the question, how then does a uh, Christian deal with this? How, how does he act? What, what's his reaction to it? Well, when we look at 1 Peter 4 and verse 19, Peter told us by inspiration, Wherefore let them that suffer according, now notice that, according to the will of God, commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing, as unto a faithful Creator. So, as a Christian, we, we need to be careful that if we enter a, a time when we're being uh, mistreated because we're Christians, not because we've done something to, to aggravate people, but because uh, we are holding to the truth, proclaiming the truth, acting like a Christian, well, that's what God wants us to do. And as Christians, we have to accept that and say, you know, instead of being maybe critical and, oh, why am I doing this? And, and, and maybe going beyond that, not wrong to ask why. Job did. He was never condemned by God for asking why these things were happening to him. He didn't understand, so he asked why. It's not wrong to ask why, but it would be wrong for us then to denigrate the people who are doing these bad things to us. And we have a biblical example of that, don't we? We've got a, in fact, we've got a very good example Remember that Paul and Barnabas were beaten for just simply telling the truth, telling the gospel of Christ. And they were beaten badly. They would have been bleeding. They would have been bruised. And they were thrown into the prison. What did they do? They sang praises to God. They glorified His name in prayer. Now, you know, it would have been real easy, wouldn't it? It'd be real easy for them to have said, why, those old rotten people, look what they did to us, and, and act in that kind of way. Look at Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Jesus said, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now notice, again, not persecuted because you murdered somebody, or you stole from somebody, or, or one of those things, or, or any evil thing. Blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The eternal kingdom belongs to them. Who? Those who are happy, who maintain a balance that says, I'm, I'm suffering this, but I didn't do anything wrong. After careful examining, I didn't do anything wrong. Notice what he goes on to say. Blessed are ye... When men shall revile you and persecute you and falsely, notice, falsely, for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. You know, we have to be honest. If we had been in Paul's position, it would have been hard to rejoice, wouldn't it, with my back bleeding and bruised up from the beating that I'd taken. And remember, when a Roman scourge someone or beat them with the rods of justice as they were used. I forget the name of the, the thing that they use. It's, you, you see it on a dime or used to see it on a dime. It's these sticks that are all and then there's an axe head at the top. That was made so that those sticks can be taken out and the governor could order someone to be beaten with it. So they didn't have a limit like the Jews did. 
They could beat them as long as they wanted to, as long as they didn't kill them. Blessed are who? The persecuted. Though, uh, you know, the, those who are reviled. Those who are having evil things said about them and they didn't do anything wrong. Think about Jesus there. Look at all that was said about him. Even going to the point of bells above. He couldn't do the things he's doing except bells above with him. That's pretty bad, folks. Call him Jesus, basically Satan or one of Satan's followers. But he says, rejoice and be exceeding glad. Why should I rejoice? Why should I be exceedingly glad? For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they, the prophets which were before you. And when you go back into the Old Testament, and you start looking at how the prophets of God were treated, <laughs> pretty bad. And this was something that had gone on and on. Uh, in verse 21, <clears throat> excuse me, so when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. So we see, first of all, the word threaten. Uh, the original word is to menace or uh, add to uh, uh, threats that were already, had already been made to them. And so the Sanhedrin added threats to their former threats. They've been told before, don't you speak in this name. They've been told before, we're going to try and wipe this, this movement out, as the Sanhedrin thought about it. So why did they let the apostles go? <laughs> Fear the people. They couldn't punish them, number one, because it was a good deed that was done. You know, wouldn't they have looked foolish if they'd have said, hey, you know, we know that you healed this man and, and he's able to walk now and he couldn't walk before, but we're going to beat you with 40 stripes save one. How foolish would they have looked because you healed this man? Now, the people wouldn't put up with that. They were afraid of the people. They're, they're scared to death of the people. If they had not been afraid of the people, you can guarantee that just like Jesus, they would have tried to put these men to death. You, you can just count on it. They had no just charge to level against Jesus, but what did they do? They went ahead and demanded that he be crucified. The people were glorifying God. And this, you know, I, I've tried to put myself in the position of the Sanhedrin at this time. And if I had been a, a member of the Sanhedrin, and I see all these people glorifying God because a miracle has been performed that they cannot deny and will not deny, where would I be? Wouldn't I be a little nervous, I think, a little apprehensive about doing anything? They were afraid of the people. What will the people do? What will they say? Now, this gives us another indication. There are a lot of people who are obeying the gospel. There are a lot of people in Jerusalem who are obeying the gospel. Uh, Jackson, uh, I can't remember the exact figure that he gave, but I know it was over 50%. He believed that over 50% of the people of Jerusalem had become Christians in a very short time. Not days after they, the church was started, but you know, very quickly. And we see 3,000, 5,000. Uh, well, wait a minute. Those passages talk about the men. What about the women? And we see the Bible saying that they multiplied. Well, you know, multiplication is not like addition. One plus one equals two. Two plus two equals four. No, wait a minute. Two times four is eight. They understood that God's hand was behind this. And the people weren't going to buck it. If they had punished the apostles, the people would clearly, without any doubt, seen that these so-called religious leaders were being disobedient to God. And I think they understood that. I think they saw it. Listen to the advice of one of the great teachers uh, that, that uh, the 
that he gave later that they ignored. On another occasion, then stood there at one in the council a Pharisee named Gamaliel. Now, Gamaliel, uh, how would I put this? He was considered to be one of the greatest rabbis or teachers uh, of the Jewish religion and the Jewish faith and history, uh, greater than any that had come before him. Uh, huh? Acts 5, 34, 38-39. She reminds me that the people that are watching can't see that. Gamaliel was the... Uh, okay, let me ask you this question. What did Mary call Jesus after His resurrection? In the garden. Rabboni. That was the highest term that could be used of a teacher. And Gamaliel was the first of all the rabbis, teachers, who was ever given that title. It's different than rabbi. It means more excelling than, than a rabbi. This man was the greatest teacher up to that time, considered by the Jews of their religion, their faith, their uh, laws, uh, etc. Now notice, he's a doctor of the law. He is had in reputation among all the people. Now that's interesting because you can be recognized as a great teacher by a small group. You can be recognized as a great teacher maybe by uh, the uh, uh, associates that you have as fellow teachers, but by all and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. Now I want you to notice something. In both cases, the one we're looking at in our text, John and, and uh, Peter, they're put aside just a little bit. But in the case of Gamaliel, this was more than just a little bit. He, he had them put aside to the point where they couldn't hear what was going on. And he said, now I say unto you, Refrain from these men and let them alone. Why? For if this counsel or this work be of men, it's going to vanish with time. It'll go away. It, it won't be worth anything. People will stop following it. But if it be of God, you can't overthrow it. Because if you try, you're going to be fighting against God. Now that's good advice, isn't it? They had, again, the history, the prophets, Moses, all of these people forecasting the coming of Messiah. He had fulfilled all the prophecies, and they knew it. And yet, they're fighting against God. They're doing exactly the thing that their wise teacher said, don't do it. Look at verse 22. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. Now we see the age. For 40 years, Dr. Luke gave one, of the, one, one more piece of evidence uh, about this man. He's been this way for 40 years. He's never been able to walk. I remember Dr. Luke, whom the Spirit had write the book of Acts, as well as the gospel, as we call it, of Luke. He was a medical doctor. He could have figured out this guy was faking. He could have looked at the man's legs and seen how skinny they were, and, and muscle would hardly be there of someone who had been in that condition for 40 years. He knew this wasn't any fake. He's over 40. He's not a child. He, he can't outgrow this situation. No human cure was available to heal this man. And yet, he was healed. Oh, he'd been laid at the gate daily for, for, for years. And everyone knew him. 
It couldn't have been a delusion. If it was a delusion, you know, sometimes people can be deluded into thinking something, but all of that crowd wasn't delusional. This man's walking, he's jumping. Even the Sanhedrin recognized, remember, that he was standing before them healed. They couldn't deny it. Christianity is grounded on evidence that can be proved. Now, somebody might say, oh, but I want to criticize that, I, that what you just said. Bob, uh, you know, uh, we can't go and see this man healed. Uh, but we can check out all the other evidence. I know that Jesus was born. Why? It's not just because the Bible says so, although that ought to be enough. It's because secular history has recorded this man, Christ, having died by the hands of the Romans, don't forget those Jews who demanded to be crucified, and crucified. This Christianity is grounded in truth. He rose from the grave. It can be proved. The witnesses never recounted. Never. Christianity itself and the evidence that was provided by the apostles that what they said came from God constantly affirmed that Jesus was the Son of God, that Messiah they had looked for all of these years. <coughs> Look at verse 23. <coughs> and being let go, they went on their uh, uh, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had to say unto them. Who is their own company? Well, I think it's the apostles. I believe it's the apostles. At, at the very least, it'd be all other disciples, some group of, of, of the Lord's disciples that are gathered somewhere, and he went to them. We see Peter later on doing what? After being released from the prison by the Spirit of God, where did he go? He went to the house of one he knew they would be there praying about his situation. He went to their house. Kind of funny, isn't it, that the, the maid <laughs> hears the knocking at the door, and when she goes to find out, you know, who, who is it? And Peter answered her, and she knew it was Peter. She goes running back and tells her, didn't open the door, you know. Uh, I've always thought that was rather humorous myself, but uh, you can imagine Peter continuing to knock on the door. Come on, let me in. Where else would Peter and John have desired to go except to be in the company of the apostles, other apostles, and disciples of Jesus? People all over the world are very much alike. We like to associate with people who are like-minded. Our society has developed the word for it, and they call it tribal. Uh, and and it, it, it's not necessarily a bad word. It can be used in a bad way. But think about it. The Lord's people, do we not tend to be tribal? Don't we like to be around people who also believe in Christ, who has also submitted themselves to His will, being baptized for the remission of their sins, and thus being added to the Lord's church, the Lord's kingdom by Himself? Hmm. I wouldn't have wanted to be anywhere else, would you? On Sunday, why would I want to be anywhere else except with the Lord's people? If I can, you know, if I'm not sick, if you're sick, the person needs to stay home. Don't, don't bring your sickness and give it to me or everybody else. When the trials of life come, that ought to be exactly who you and I want to be around, no matter what that trial is. And I would suggest we should also want to be around them in times of happiness. We want, we want to give and, and encourage others. Well, do you encourage them by saying, oh, man, I, I'm just, this week has been so terrible and I've been beaten down and blah, blah, blah. And, no, they don't want, that's not going to be encouraging. But when we tell them good news, that's encouraging, isn't it? They gave a report of all that 
had been said. Mm -mm -mm. It often amazes me, because I don't have a good memory, how they could be in a position where they can tell everything that happened. How do you do that? I know some people do, and I've seen people that do it. You can tell them something, and 20 years later, they remember it. They gave a report of all that had been said, and that included the command not to speak in the name of Jesus by the Sanhedrin. So what are they going to do? <laughs> Don't you teach anything about him. Well, what are they going to do? That would talk about the Sanhedrin murdering Jesus. Uh, you'd have to talk about his resurrection from the dead and they got the command, don't you tell, talk about this. You're going to have to talk about his glorification by God in raising him from the dead and taking him home, rising up through that cloud. Won't that be a great day to see him coming in the cloud? Won't it be a great day to be able to join him in that cloud and to be taken to heaven itself. All of these threats of punishment, just because they didn't teach what the Sanhedrin wanted them to teach. Now look at verse 24. And when they, they who? The people that John and Peter went and joined themselves to, their brethren, whether it be the apostles only or the apostles and brethren or just brethren. When they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. And they said, Lord, Thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and sea and all that in them is. Notice what they said. What did they do when Peter and John told them everything that had been said? Did, did they look to hide somewhere? Oh, oh, may, I, I better find me a cave somewhere where nobody can find me. Who in the Old Testament did just that? Elijah, wasn't it? Elijah did exactly that. You remember the great victory that was had on Mount Carmel? And over 400 priests of this idol worship were killed because they could clearly see the difference. The people killed them. Because they could clearly see the difference between God's servant and what he did and what this Molech or Dagon or whichever one it was, I forget. But whichever one it was, couldn't do. You know, and think about this. When Elijah, when it came his turn, what did he do? He said, You'll go get a bunch of water. He drowned that altar, in water. He had a trench around it and, and filled up that trench with water and they just kept pouring it on and pouring it on until it got full. And then he made his petition to God. And I love what was said next. God didn't just light the fire. Fire came down, consumed the offering, the wood, the stones that had been piled up to make this altar, and all the water in the trench. Thou art God. I've been reading a book about magnification of God, magnification of Christ, magnification of the Spirit. You know, there's only one thing that really needs to be said. I mean, there are a lot of things you can say, and they're good things. Don't misunderstand. But really, you can sum it up. Thou art God. There's nothing you can't do. They didn't look for a place to hide. They, they didn't decide, okay, now it's time for us to go underground. And that would happen later. And folks, with some of the things we're seeing nowadays, there may come a time when we're going to have to go underground. We won't be able to meet in places like this without the stormtroopers coming in taking us to prison, killing some of us, etc. It could come. And if you think things can't change that fast, look at the wall in Berlin. 
and how fast Soviet Russia fell. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. They didn't go underground with their teaching. Instead, they prayed. When we're going through hardships, is the first thing we think about doing after we've reconciled, you know, that this is what's happening to us, go to God in prayer? When we hear about some wonderful thing that maybe has happened to one of our brethren, do we immediately think about praying to God and giving Him credit for it? We should. They give us the example of that. Two words are used to designate God <coughs> excuse me, in this text. The word God that is primarily used is theos, the Greek word theos. The word Lord is despotes. What does that mean? Despot. Absolute ruler. God is our absolute ruler. And these words are used in this context to designate God. Theos, despotes. Now, despotes is a word that's often used to, to show a distinction between a master and his servant. You see how the word is, uh, it, is, it, it clarifies God in the sense that he is our master and we are his servants. Look at uh, uh, Titus 2, 9 through 10. Exhort servants to ob be obedient unto their own despotes. What's he saying? Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own master. And to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloring or embezzling, not showing all, or but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, Theos, our Savior, in all things. You can also look at 1 Timothy 6 1 and see the same thing. 1 Peter 2, verse 18. Consider their need for prayer. You know, sometimes I think. Prayer may be one of the most neglected things that we as Christians do. Uh, I'm very sincere about that. I, I know in my own life there have been times when I haven't prayed like I should have. It should be something that is always beside. That's how we communicate with our God. No, we don't hear Him in a voice saying, answering us, but that's how we communicate with Him. That's how we let him know what we're thinking. Uh, what we, uh, and not that he doesn't know what we're thinking all the time, but he does. But know and, and pour out. He knows what we, we've, we want before we even ask it. But he wants us to ask. They needed protection. I think they probably prayed about protection. Don't you talk in this name anymore. We're going to bring down the whole might of the Sanhedrin on you if you do. I think that was implied in what the Sanhedrin told Peter and John. They needed protection. And they needed encouragement. What an encouragement it was to see Peter and John walk into the midst of them. And hadn't been beaten. They needed guidance. You and ha I have God's written word to guide us, that infallible written word. They didn't have that. The apostles had the Holy Spirit, and they told the people what God wanted them to know, but it wasn't written down for a long time, and then reproduced by hand. Imagine that. Imagine if the only way you could give somebody else a Bible is you had to hand write it, every single word. They didn't have the written word then. They lifted up their voices with one accord. I wonder how many brethren, when someone in our public worship assembly gets up to lead 
a public prayer on behalf of the congregation, I wonder how many actually repeat the words or are thinking about what that man is saying. And I, I say that because I've heard people amen prayers that weren't biblical at all. You've probably heard it too, uh, William, over the years. People that express things in their prayer that aren't biblical, aren't according to God's will. And then they'll say, amen. Wait a minute. Either they don't know enough of God's word to know that error was being said, or they just really weren't paying attention. Their common prayer, their common concern is what they talked about. Wizerby said something I thought was rather interesting. He said, prayer is not an escape from responsibility. It is our response to God's ability. And I think that's absolutely true. We don't know how God works. We know He works in His providential way today. In the past, He's worked in the, in the miraculous, in the time of the uh, apostles, in the Mosaic age, in the patriarchal age. But He doesn't work miraculously today, but He does work providentially. And we don't know how it is. We may think that something's providential. I'll, I'll be real honest. I think, but it's only I think, that Jenny meeting me was providential because she was a member of a denomination. And I wasn't very faithful at the time, but I refused to go to that denomination, which I knew enough. I knew, don't go there. And now, all her life, the earliest prayers of her life, she wanted to grow up and marry a Christian and have babies. Well, what did she do? She met me. And it was a very unusual circumstance. Where I can think that that was God's providence, but I don't know for sure. I don't have the right to say and should not say that was God's providence. Maybe it was, maybe it was. Maybe it was just pure accident that I happened to go to that place where she was and then ask her for a date and have her mama <laughs> Uh, say, after Jenny had told her on the phone and asked if it was all right if she rode home with me, if I took her home, and she found out I had a motorcycle. That was back in the age when you had a motorcycle, you were just automatically branded as a hood. And she told me years later, she said, all I could think about, and by the way, her Sunday school teacher was visiting. All she could think about was greasy hair and black leather jacket. That's all she could think about. Prayer is not an escape from our responsibility. We have to do our part. And it's our response to God's ability. He can make it happen. He does make things happen. And you and I, we don't see it. We may think it is, but do we know for sure? No. God is a Christian's source of power. It's a Christian source of ability. I have no doubt that God is in control. And He uses human beings to accomplish His purpose. I'm teaching the book of Exodus uh, at Jackson where I, I preach. And one of the things we've pointed out is that even a man like Pharaoh who was so determined that he was God that he wasn't going to give in to the God of heaven, the God Moses served, the God the Israelites served. But God used him to show his might and his glory to cause the nations around them to fear so badly that when the Israelites marched into the land of Canaan, the people were scared to death of them. And you know, when you're that afraid of somebody, an opponent, so to speak, you're going to lose. 
Thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and everything that's in them. You know, I heard a man say one time, he said, well, you know, there weren't all these breeds of dogs when God made the earth. When they came into existence, others will say, without God being in the picture, evolution. And, and we've, we've cross-breeded some of these dogs, and man, we, we've come up with a whole huge variety of them. Hmm. My answer to them would be very simple. God made the dog, and he put all of the DNA in that dog so that all of these varieties could be made. He did. Just like he put the DNA in every single human being upon the face of the earth. And that's why one of you has black hair, and one of you has partially gray and brownish hair, and, and one blonde. Don't get me started on blonde jokes. And one that's getting bald. The DNA is there. And as the people progressed in growth, it showed itself. In six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Notice that the apostles on this occasion are being led by the Holy Spirit to quote Exodus 20 and verse 11. The apostles, you see, did not subscribe to the illogical ideas and that, you know, the universe just somehow exploded from some little bitty teeny thing. You know, I've seen a lot of explosions in my life. In Vietnam, I created some of those explosions. And I never saw them do one thing that was good. I mean, it was good from the standpoint of, yeah, we destroyed that and they can't use that anymore. But really, an explosion, it destroys things. It doesn't create things. So we can throw that theory out. It's amazing, too, to me to see more and more scientists who are willing to admit truth say that evolution's a lie. It, it really fascinates me, and I hope that they keep it up. The idea that the universe somehow existed all by itself and, and created itself, and that's just foolishness. The one who made everything, because he made everything, because he is the all-powerful one, he has the right to tell me how I'm supposed to live my life. He has the right to tell everybody who has ever lived on the face of this, or whoever will live on the face of this earth. Here is what you're supposed to do. Here's what you are supposed to be. Now, we're not talking about an architect or a builder or whatever. We're talking about religion, faith. I am supposed to be in this age a Christian, a faithful Christian who follows the Word of God. Look at verse 25. Who by the mouth of thy servant David, oh, look here, they're going to quote again, hast said, why did the heathen rage and the heap, uh, people imagine vain things? The apostles, notice, show their stamp of approval on the book of Psalms as being from God. They've already shown us that the book of Genesis was uh, given by God, these inspired men. Why did the heathen rage? The word rage is uh, interesting because it, it signifies someone who's so angry that they have trouble speaking and they kind of snort. You ever seen somebody that mad? You ever seen somebody that mad, William? I mean, you know, just... And the idea comes from a horse that's very spirited who, you know, I'm not going to let this guy ride me, have to really hold the reins in tight. Why did the heathen rage? Why did they allow themselves to rage and rant and, 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 and 
declare themselves opposed to God? Why did they imagine vain things? The word imagine here means to meditate. Notice the people meditated. They devised, they contrived vain, empty, worthless things. And those vain things, empty, devoid of truth, not worth anything. So Jati says, with empty hands, having nothing. And that's the truth. Those who oppose God have nothing to offer anybody else. Jenny and I the other day saw an advertisement that uh, in one way kind of shocked me. A man got on the television and he declared himself to be an atheist and he declared, I want to get religion out of government. And he made another statement. I'm not, I'm not really going to be able to quote it verbatim, but basically here's what he said. I want to get rid of religion. Okay, let's say, just for argument's sake, that he could get rid of religion. What does he offer instead? Nothing. He offers nothing. I forget the name of the city out west. Many, many years ago was built and designed from scratch. And there would be no churches in this city. It would be an atheistic city. What do you think happened to that city? It was full of lawlessness, just like we see on the streets today thievery, murder. It was so bad, they finally, the church or the uh, city fathers, finally inv invited religion to come <coughs> in. They knew atheism had proven itself that it has absolutely nothing that is good to offer. The word heathen applies to the Gentiles as it's primarily used in the scriptures or uh, anyone who's not an Israelite. Uh, or I should say uh, it's a Gentile or anyone who is not an Israelite. The Jews lumped everybody into two categories. You're either a Jew or you're a Gentile. The term people refers to the Israelites. Now notice the idea seems to be why would the Gentiles and Israelites be say, behave so arrogantly <coughs> that they would devise outright lies which absolutely have no truth against God, against God's anointed. We're being informed that all the schemes, all the plans of Jew and Gentile who are against Christ and His work, they're worthless. They have no true benefit. They could plot all they wanted to, God's designs wouldn't fail. God's design is still alive today and will be alive as long as this world exists. Why did the heathen rage like a spirited horse, trying to buck its rider off, trying to get rid of God? In the end, the spirited horse would be controlled by the reins of the master. Just so, man. It is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. The time is coming. No matter how <coughs> angry people may be with God, no matter how disobedient they, they are, no matter how right they think they are in their disobedience, they're going to bow the knee to Christ, to God the Father, and to the Spirit. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. It's all under his power. One last thought about this verse. It demonstrates that it's not wrong to quote scripture in prayer. What were they doing? They were praying. They quoted from Genesis. They quoted from uh, Psalms. Didn't they? 
Next week we'll pick up with verse 26.